Welcome to the Deep Dive. So you've brought us a fascinating set of sources today about a new large language model architecture. It's called the uh, Dragon Hatchling, BDH. That's the one, BDH. And yeah, this deep dive isn't just about benchmarks or speed. The claim in this research, the big one, is that BDH might actually be the missing link we've been looking for. A missing link. Between what? Between the, you know, the massive AI models we build, the transformers and such, and how the brain actually seems to work these distributed graph-like systems, BDH is proposed as that theoretical bridge. Okay, that's definitely a bold mission statement. Mm -hmm. So our goal today is to really unpack this research, figure out what makes BDH tick, because it claims to tackle a really fundamental challenge for LLMs. Right, the generalization problem, specifically how models reason over time. Yeah, the unpredictability. I mean, you look at existing models, even powerful ones like GPT-2 back in the day, they were great, but they sort of hit a wall, didn't they? They did, especially with complex reasoning, like chain of thought. If you push them too far beyond their training data, made the sequences much longer or the logic trickier, they often just failed to generalize systematically. There wasn't a solid theoretical guarantee for how they behave. And that lack of uh, foreseeability, hmm. that's the scary part if you're thinking about autonomous agents running long term. It's huge. You just can't prove that an agent built on those older architectures won't eventually fall into some kind of weird, unpredictable state when it's out in the wild facing things it wasn't explicitly trained on for ages. That's kind of the existential problem for reliable, long-running AI. So BDH steps in here. The sources are suggesting it brings together strong theory ideas borrowed from physics, distributed systems, but also manages to perform roughly on par with models like GPT-2. How? Exactly. They achieve it by, well, rethinking the whole network structure. They're moving away from those big, dense matrix calculations where everything talks to everything. Towards something more biological. Yeah, towards a model that looks more like a biological network, something yeah. scale-free, based on local interactions between neuron-like components. Okay, let's really get into that. Moving from dense tensors to these locally interacting neuron particles, you said. How does that fix the mismatch between current AI and, you know, brain structure? Well, it tackles that structural difference directly. LLMs usually crunch these huge centralized matrices, the brain. It's fundamentally distributed, a dynamic graph. BDH tries to mimic that graph structure using, uh, let's call them neur neuron particles that only interact locally. So no more giant matrix multiplications for attention. That's like the core of a transformer. What does BDH do instead? They replace it with something they call closed form local graph dynamics at neurons and synapses. It's quite a phrase. They even ambitiously call these dynamics the equations of reasoning. It's essentially a local edge reweighting process on this graph. Equations of reasoning. Okay, that definitely sounds more brain-like. Yep. What are the specific biological features they built in? Well, the model has these non-neurons, and they're organized into excitatory and inhibitory circuits, which is pretty standard neuroscience, right? It also uses integrate and fire thresholds for signals, mimicking how real neurons decide to activate. Standard stuff so far. But you mentioned memory earlier. The working memory aspect sounds different. In a transformer, that's kind of baked into the attention weights and embeddings, isn't it? Fixed, more or less. Exactly. And here's the kicker for BDH. Working memory, the stuff it holds onto while it's thinking through a problem during inference, relies entirely on synaptic plasticity. Plasticity. You mean the connections are changing on the fly? Precisely. Using Hebbian learning, the old neurons that fire together, wire together idea, but applied dynamically in real time just for the computation itself. Whoa. So the act of reasoning, the inference process, is itself temporarily rewriting the connections based on what's active. That's not just retrieving info, that's actively reshaping the computational pathways. You got it. And this isn't slow long-term learning. It's happening at rapid potentiation scales. We're talking <laughs> updates over hundreds of tokens. If you map that to brain time, it's like the minutes long time scale of conscious thought. The memory needed for the task is the changing structure. Okay, so if you build a system based on these local rules, mm. heavy updates. Yeah. What does the overall network look like? Does a predictable structure emerge? It does, and that's another key finding. The network of these neuron interactions actually self-organizes. It forms a graph that has high modularity, like little communities, and a heavy-tailed degree distribution. A fitty-tailed, meaning some neurons have way more connections than others. Exactly. And in network science, that's the signature of a scale-free graph. Scale-free networks pop up everywhere in nature, right? They're known for being robust, adaptable, but what's the significance here for AI generalization? 
It's critical. Scale-free structures often operate near criticality, a state balance between order and chaos, which is thought to be important for complex computation. But even more crucially for AI theory, this structure suggests BDH might achieve uniform, predictable behavior in the limit. They call it the thermodynamic limit. Thermodynamic limit. That sounds intense. Why is reaching that limit considered such a big deal for AI? Like the holy grail you mentioned. Okay, think about gas in a box from physics. You can't track every molecule, right? But you can predict the overall behavior pressure, temperature, when you have tons of molecules, essentially infinite. The thermodynamic limit lets you predict the system's behavior when it's massive and runs forever. Ah, so it give you predictability at scale. Exactly. If you can define that limit mathematically, you can start putting real bounds on its reasoning generalization over time. Think pack-like bounds, probably approximately correct. It shifts AI away from being this opaque black box towards something potentially provably reliable. That's a huge conceptual jump. Okay, theory is great, but let's get practical. We've got this elegant graph dynamic model, but our workhorse is the GPU, which loves tensors, loves matrix math. How do they actually build this? Right, bridging theory and practice. That brings us to BDH GPU. It's the version designed for GPUs using tensors, but, and this is key, it keeps the core BDH principles alive. How is it structured then, this BDH dash GPU? It's parameterized mainly by two numbers. One dollar, which is a very large dimension representing neurons or concepts, and dollars, which is a much smaller, low-ranked dimension. So another is way bigger than dollar. Okay, dollar diudo. Why that specific split? Big down, small dollars. How does that keep the biology but work on a GPU? Good question. The total number of parameters is roughly $30. The massive dollar dimension holds onto that huge conceptual space needed for the scale-free properties and the biological link. But the small dollar, that low rank dimension, that's the trick for efficiency. Mm. It lets them use matrix factorization tricks. And importantly, it allows them to use linear attention. It operates in the big null space, but because of the low rank structure enabled by dollars, it's much, much cheaper computationally than the standard nonlinear softmax attention in transformers. That small dollar makes it parallelizable for GPUs. So efficiency from the small dollar, capacity from the huge dollar. Makes sense. How does this BDH GPU actually perform? Does it keep up with standard transformers optimized purely for performance? Well, according to the sources, the results are pretty compelling. BDH just GPU apparently rivals GPT-2 architecture performance on typical NLP tasks like language modeling and translation. And it seems to follow similar scaling laws as you increase parameters from like 10 million up to a billion. So they didn't trade performance for theory, basically. It looks that way. They seem to have gotten both, which is pretty significant. Let's talk efficiency again. The brain is incredibly efficient, dense transformers, not so much lots of computation. You mentioned sparsity earlier. How does BDH handle that? Ah, yeah, sparsity. This is another place where it looks more biological. BDH GPU is designed so it's activation vectors. The keys and queries for attention are positive and sparse. They use a specific component, a ReLU low rank block, to enforce this. Enforced by design. And so what do they actually see in practice? How sparse is it? Extremely sparse. The papers report activation sparsity around the 5% level, so only about 5% of the entries in those vectors are non-zero during a typical calculation. 5%. Compared to a dense model where it might be closer to, what, 90 or 100%? Exactly. Think about the energy savings just in the forward pass. It's a massive reduction in computational effort compared to activating nearly everything all the time. There was a connection to predictability, too. Right? It's not just sparse, yeah. but selectively sparse. Absolutely. This is really neat. They observe that neurons in higher layers become less active. The activation vector gets sparser when the input sequence is predictable. And so if the model kind of knows what's coming next. It doesn't need to fire up as many circuits, basically. It saves energy. This looks a lot like the conditional computation people try to build into efficient transformers with complex routing. But here it seems to emerge naturally from the neuron dynamics. No extra gates needed. That inherent structure, the predictability, the potential for mathematical bounds, mm. it feels like this ties into a different way of thinking about AI safety and understanding. The sources mentioned moving beyond just interpretable AI. Right. They frame it as moving towards axiomatic AI. Explain that distinction. Interpretable AI is about looking inside after the fact, trying to figure out why it did what it did, right? Yeah, reverse engineering the black box. Axiomatic AI, as they describe it, is more about having a system whose fundamental rules, its axioms, allow you to predict how it's expected to behave over time, 
under different conditions yep. because you understand the underlying dynamics. And BDH lends itself to this because the state is more localized. Exactly. Remember the Hebbian learning at the synapses? The attention state, the context, isn't smeared across a giant matrix. It's literally represented by the strength of individual connections between neuron particles, the synapses. You can potentially zoom in much closer. Microinterpretation, you called it. So you could look at one specific synapse and know what concept it's currently holding or strengthening. Is that feasible? That's the claim, and it's a big one. They report empirical evidence for monosemanticity. Monosemanticity, meaning one synapse, one meter. Pretty much. That specific individual synapses reliably strengthen their connection whenever the model processes or reasons about one particular abstract concept. Got an example. That sounds quite specific. They gave examples like identifying a specific currency synapse or a country synapse. So imagine this. Whether the input was livre sterling in French or British pound in English, the same single synapse would activate and strengthen. Wow. So the synaptic strength becomes axiomatically tied to the concept of the British pound, regardless of the specific word used. That's the idea. The temporary memory state is localized and conceptually specific. Okay. If concepts are encoded locally like that, and the system scales predictably in that big neuron dimension, what does that mean for combining models? Usually, sticking two LLMs together is a messy nightmare. Right. But this structure seems to allow for something completely new. They actually did experiments merging different BDH GPU models. Merging them? They took two models trained on different tasks, say, English to French translation and English to Portuguese translation, and they literally just concatenated their parameters along the big garden dimension. Just some together, like, side by side. Essentially, yeah. Like splicing two lists together based on that neuron dimension. No complex retraining or alignment needed. It worked. What happened to the merged model? Apparently, the resulting larger model could perform both translation tasks effectively, retaining the knowledge from the original two models without further training. That's huge. That implies you could treat these models more like composable software modules, build specialized pieces, and then combine them. Exactly. It supports that idea of LLMs as composable computer programs. Imagine specializing models for different domains, medicine, law, whatever, and then merging them as needed. It could make updates, specialization, even patching vulnerabilities way easier and cheaper than retraining everything. Okay, let's pull back a bit. This BDH research seems to have hit a lot of targets. That theoretical link between LLMs and brain models, competitive performance, this scale-free structure, and now this remarkable interpretability and composability. It really ties a lot of threads together, and the implications loop right back to neuroscience too. If these affects the modularity, scale-free structure, heavy in learning if they're sufficient to produce complex reasoning and language at brain scale. Then maybe not all the complex biological details we see in the brain are strictly necessary for the computation of thought. That's the implication. Maybe some of the really complex electrochemical stuff is more about long-term memory consolidation, biological maintenance, things like that, rather than the core logic of reasoning itself. So wrapping this up, what's the big takeaway for you listening to this? For the engineer thinking about building the next generation of AI? Well, the core idea is that these dynamics, human-like reasoning and synaptic plasticity working together on the time scale of minutes seem fundamentally linked built on relatively simple local rules like Hebbian learning. Simple rules, complex emergent behavior. Right. And if this kind of minimal dynamic system is enough for complex thought, it forces us to ask a really interesting engineering question. What parts of biology, what complex patterns we thought were essential are actually just baggage? What computationally expensive features may be only needed for permanent biological memory can we potentially discard from our AI designs now that we have maybe, just maybe, a biologically plausible blueprint for intelligence that is also predictable and interpretable? What can we leave behind? A very provocative thought indeed. Definitely something to mull over.